up, Edge Church? How are we doing this morning? Oh, good to see you guys. 11 o'clock, man. The awake people. How about that? Well, good to see you. Yeah, today we're continuing the series we kicked off last week called Double Dog Dare You. And we're looking at some of the most challenging and inspirational teachings of Jesus. And the reason we're calling it Double Dog Dare You is because as a kid, I used to love to be dared to do something. Anybody love to be dared? You know, your adrenaline starts pumping and you're like, I'm going to do that. So I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you to follow the teachings of Jesus. Because you know what? I know that there's going to be great fruitfulness, great power, great strength in your life if you will do these things that we're talking about. Last week we talked about I am the resurrection and the life from John chapter 11. Today I want to turn our attention to John chapter 15. And I want us to look today at verses 1 through 5. And if you've ever felt tired or exhausted or burned out, or worn out, or, or just your enthusiasm ha has just continued to wane, this is the message for you. Today, you need John chapter 15. Let's look at these words of Jesus here, beginning in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so it will be even more fruitful. And then in verse 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Not some things, but nothing, it says. And uh, I love John 1 through 5. Powerful words today for us. I also... I uh, had an opportunity this week to read the same verses in the Pigeon Bible. Anybody know what Pigeon is? Pigeon is Hawaiian slang. Yeah, like three people are like, yeah, Pigeon. And sometimes I read the Pigeon Bible just for fun. You know, I am a white guy, but I mean, I like Pigeon. It's cool, you know. And, and I want to read this to you today in the Pigeon language the best that I can. Are you guys ready for this? Oh my goodness, I've been practicing on this all week long. Let's check this out in Pigeon, okay? <coughs> Listen up. I had a guy that you guys stay tight with. I just like the grapevine. But me, I feel real kind. My father, he just liked the farmer guy that take care of the grapevine. And all the people that stay tight with me, but they do not do nothing. My father take them off just like the grapevine farmer guy and take them off of the branches that no more fruit. And all the people that stay tight with me, he take away the junk kind stuff from inside them just like when the grape farmer guy trimmed the branches so they get plenty fruit. Me, I just like the grapevine. And you guys, just like the branches and whoever come tight with me already, and I stay tight with them, they're going to be just like one branch, they get plenty fruit. Because you guys no can do nothing if you no stay tight with me. How about that? Thank you very much. You didn't know that I spoke pigeon. Well, I love this, this pigeon thing because... The, the phrase that's used here is, stay tight with me. And in the NIV, it's abide in me. In the Pigeon Bible, it's stay tight with me. It's the same phrase. Eleven times in John 15, abide in me, dwell in me, stay tight with me, if you will, is used to talk about this relationship between the branch and the vine and Jesus and his disciples and really, this is the key to the Christian life. You can't live the Christian life apart from abiding in Jesus. Well, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? What, it, what does it mean to stay tight with Jesus, if you will? Well, it, it means, first of all, that it's, it's about the relationship more than it is about the rules because a branch and a vine have a relationship. Just like a person has a relationship with Jesus. They're interconnected. They're interwoven. It's about the relationship. It's about the relationship. But when we abide in Jesus, we're giving Jesus thanks for his blessings in our lives. We confess our sins when God convicts us of something. 
We are looking to Jesus to guide us and direct us in the decisions that we're making. That's what it means to abide in Jesus. To abide in Jesus means to have a regular, consistent relationship with Him. And Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, if you don't abide in the vine, you cannot have spiritual fruit. We have to look at our lives this morning and say, man, am I being fruitful? You know, am am I bearing all of the fruit that I want to bear? Do I have all the joy that I want to have? Do I have all the love and all the peace and and, 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 and all of the spiritual fruit in my life that I want to have. And if not, the question is, are we abiding in Jesus? Are we abiding in Him? Are we abiding in Jesus? Are we doing that? You know, it's kind of like a, in the marriage, you can stand at an altar and say, I do. You can sign the wedding certificate. You can consummate the relationship. You can have a union, but you can have a union without communion. And communion in a relationship is built through communication, through serving one another, through loving each other, through, through, through working through problems together. You've got to build the marriage. And, and you can be married and, 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 and have a husband and a wife and yet not be connected. You've got to build that thing. You got you got to stay together. You got to abide. You got to you got to dwell together. You got to stay tight with in order for the for the marriage to to really gel. Got to have that relationship. Jesus is saying it's about relationship. It's about relationship. It's not just about signing the dotted line. It's not even just about saying a prayer. It's not about just coming to church. It's about being connected to the vine. Relationship. Speaking of relationships, I have a special friend at church today. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but this is called a Furby. Anybody here ever seen a Furby? May have a Furby? All right. How many of you still have an active Furby in the house? Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. You guys know what I'm talking about. This is like the 1990s model of the Furby right here. It's like old school. This was in Natalie Self, one of our worship leaders. This was in her garage, okay? She loaned me her Furby. I didn't know what a Furby was before this week. But Furby is this interesting little creature, and you have to take care of Furby. It's like a high-maintenance, like, stuffed animal. Because when Furby gets tired, uh, she says, i tired, and you have to go tuck her into bed. And if you don't do that, you know what will happen? Furby will nag you. She will keep talking about going to bed until you finally put Furby to bed. If she says, I sad, you have to pet her, okay? And if you don't pet her, again, keep that nagging thing going. And, and if she's hungry, you have to open her mouth like this, and you have to massage kind of the inside. And I know you guys in the back can't quite see this, but you got to kind of do like this to feed Furby. Or again, Furby will keep nagging. It's not good. <laughs> you got to have a relationship. You gotta have a relationship with the Furby. You gotta take care of the Furby. You gotta be connected to the Furby. If you don't, then Furby is not gonna be happy. It's not gonna be good. It's kind of like the Gigapet. Anybody here have a Gigapet? Yeah, a couple people. Like you had those on your backpack when you took them to school. Like, like you know, if you went to school like in the '90s, you know, my wife was a teacher and she had kids that had the Gigapets, and and the alarm would go off on this little on the little keychain. It was time to feed the pet or time to take the pet pet to the bathroom if, if you didn't tend to the pet the pet would die and then the little wings would come out you know it would go to like pet heaven it was really sad you want to talk about drama in the classroom have a bunch of little giga pets going to pet heaven it wasn't good they have to be maintained the relationships got to stay intact you can't forget about the pet Listen, you can't forget about Jesus. You got to abide in Him. You got to keep talking to Him. You got to keep growing in Him. You got to keep working with Him. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying for us to do. Every moment we need Jesus. And when we abide in Jesus, we will bear spiritual fruit. When we abide in Jesus, we will, we will please the Lord. When we abide in Jesus, we will have more joy than we've ever known before. We will have the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our life. We've got to abide in Him. And uh, that's why the Bible tells us, first of all, Jesus is the only vine. He's the only vine. Jesus is the vine. He's the vine. Look at verse 1. I am the true vine, and the Father is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. And the vine is the source of sustenance. The branches have nothing 
if they're not connected to the vine, right? You got to have the branch is connect to the to the vine for the branch to be healthy. And Jesus is the vine. Now we try to latch on to a lot of other things in our lives. We try to find purpose and meaning and significance and so many other things in 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 a lot of other things other than Jesus. And Jesus says, "I am the one and only true vine." In fact, uh, this this verb here in the language of the New Testament, actually, Jesus is saying, I myself and I alone am the true vine. In other words, there should be no other vines in our lives. Sometimes we look to our career as a vine. Sometimes we look to a relationship as a vine. Sometimes we look to a drug as a vine. Sometimes we look at our bank account or our achievements or who we know. That's my vine. i got to be connected to that. i got to find sustenance and nutrients from that. Jesus says, I am the vine. He's the vine. No one else. He's the true vine. And that's why we get frustrated with other people sometimes because we expect other people to be our vine. I need you to encourage me. I need you to bless me. I need you to help me. You know what? Relationships are great. We need people in our lives. But, but is it also true to say this, that Jesus can meet needs that people cannot? We need to stay connected to him. And if we look to people to meet all of the needs that Jesus is supposed to meet, we will be frustrated and disappointed with the people. Because people cannot do what God can do in our lives. Jesus is the one and only. He's the true vine. The pastor is not your vine. Your friends are not your vine. Jesus is the vine. He's the source. He's the, he, he's the thing that we have to stay anchored to in our lives. So Jesus is the vine, but God is the gardener. God is the gardener. He cuts off, look at verse 2, every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So God is the master gardener. God is the master gardener. His responsibilities are to prune the plants. How many, do we have some gardening people today? You hear, like you like to work in the yard and get out there and prune stuff. You know that, that when you're pruning bushes or trees or flowers, you've got to cut off the dead branches so that the other branches can be more healthy, right? You've got to, you've got to, Prune those off because the nutrients of the plant are still being utilized by the dead branches. And so it's sucking life away from the good branches. So you prune the bad branches and and the whole plant is healthier. It's what happens. And the same is true in the Christian life. When you walk with God, when you're abiding in Jesus, God will begin to prune things out of our lives. Sometimes it's pruning relationships out of our lives. Sometimes it's pruning priorities out of our lives. Sometimes it, 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 it's pruning whatever may be taking away from what God wants to do in our lives. We go through the pruning process. See, some of you thought you were being punished, but instead you're being pruned. God is pruning you, and that's a good thing. We need to be pruned. Now, pruning hurts a little bit, I don't think anybody's like, yeah, God, please, you know, prune me today. I I would really love that, you know. It hurts a little bit, but you know what? You're going to be more fruitful. You're going to be more productive. You're going to abide in the vine at a new level. And and God's pruning is, 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 is a sign of his love and devotion to you. So pruning is part of the process. That, that's just part of what we do. And, and you also prune to give shape to, to a plant. So a gardener is going to come out there and they're going to prune the bad branches away, but they're also going to prune the shape. Uh, and we, we had a bush in our yard a couple of years ago, and the bush was only about this tall, but it had this one branch. It was like six feet tall. I mean, I don't know if somebody had shot some steroids into that thing or what, but it was the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen before. And, and it was like kind of like space age looking stuff. So we went out there and, and I was pruning the bush and I shaped it so that the bush looked like a real bush. It didn't look like something weird, something strange. And, and you know, God does the same thing in our life. God prunes us to shape us. God says, I want you to look like this. I need you to grow here. I need you to evolve in this part of your life. I, I, I need you to mature like this. God shapes us in the pruning process. 
part of it. God is the gardener. And he prunes us to make us more fruitful as well. And if you cut the vine the wrong way, you know, you can also damage a vine or a branch. You know, if you just go out there and start hacking away at stuff, you can actually damage, damage the plant. So the gardener has to know how to prune the plant to bring about maximum productivity. God is the master gardener. God knows exactly how to prune your life. God knows exactly where to cut, how much to cut, when to do it. He knows all of that. And, and you know what? The end result is you're going to be more fruitful. We're going to be more fruitful when God is, is, is pruning us. And so I love to say this. I am cut back, but I am not cut off. Okay, I'm cut back, but I'm not cut off. In fact, reach over and just tell your neighbor that today. Yeah, I'm cut off. I'm cut back, but I'm not cut off. I'm cut back, but I'm not cut off. Cut back, but I'm not cut off. Yeah, that feels good, doesn't it? Are you guys awake today? I'm, I am preaching better than you're responding today. Somebody alive today. Come on. All right, here's the third thing. We are the branches. Okay, God is the gardener. We are the branches. Look at this, verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We are the branches. We are the branches. And this is an imperative. Jesus is saying, abide in me. These are some of the final words Jesus is saying to the disciples before his arrest. And he gives that command, that imperative. Now, when I'm not here at church, some of you guys wonder what I do. I am a youth soccer coach. I coach seven-year-old soccer. Okay, And if you come out to one of my games on Saturday, in seven-year-old soccer, the coaches get on the field. And I love this because I am out there, I'm like a general on the field of battle. I am bossing kids around. I grabbed one kid by the arm a couple weeks ago to put him in position. Gina was like, Ryan, you may want to tone that down a little bit. I, get, I am into the soccer, you know. And I'm telling, get on her. Get back on defense. Throw it in there. Kick it there. Stop that guy. Do something, you know. And I'm out there. I'm giving the kids imperatives. Those are commands. And, and I believe this is the same voice that, that, that Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He's telling them, guys, this is not an option. Remain in me. Remain in me. When I think about remain in me, I think about how, how we need to be consistent in the Christian life. You know, it, it's cool to always talk about change. We love to change things, do something new. There's a time, there's a place for that. But you know, sometimes when you're walking with Jesus... You just need to keep doing what you've already been doing. Sometimes it's just sticking with the stuff. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just keep reading God's word. It's, 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 it's keep praying. It's, it's keep showing up at church. It's, it's just keep, keep doing the right thing. Keep loving your wife. Keep praying for your kids. Just remain. Stay the same. Do the same stuff over and over and over again. Sometimes we just get discouraged doing different, doing, doing, doing the same thing. But, but you know what? The truth is there's a place, there, there's a time, there's a maturity that comes by just being consistent with Jesus. We need to remain in him. And I want to encourage you today just to keep doing what you're doing, man. If you're walking with the Lord, you just keep doing it. Keep rocking. Other people may change all kinds of stuff. Good for them. But you stay faithful to God and keep doing. You keep praying for those kids. And you keep showing up here every weekend. You know, God will do something in your life. It'd be awesome. Remain in me. It's, there's something about the power of consistency and the same. Doing the same stuff. we got to abide in Jesus. Now, when we abide in Jesus, what happens? And I want to give you these six things that you can put on your outline this, this morning. Here's the first thing. You will be pruned. Okay, When you abide in Jesus, your life will be pruned. God will cut some things out of your life in order that you can be more fruitful. We already talked about that. That's verse 2. Here's the second thing. You will be fruitful. You will be fruitful. If you abide in Jesus, you will have fruit. Now, no branch says to the vine, today I'm going to make some fruit. 
No, what happens? A branch that's properly connected to the vine just does what? Just makes fruit. Yeah, because this is the normal outcome of a healthy relationship. When we're connected, right? When we're connected to Jesus, then the fruit just starts to come. That's the natural thing. You will be fruitful when you abide in Jesus. You'll have spiritual fruit. You'll have joy. You'll have peace. You'll have patience. You'll have kindness. You'll have gentleness, self-control. All of the things that the Bible speaks to us about, that will begin to emerge in our lives. You will be fruitful. That's why verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Yeah, not just a little fruit, much fruit. I, I read this, this, this week on the internet about a grapevine in Slovenia. And if you're ever in Slovenia, you, you may want to check this out. But this grapevine has been uh, producing a crop since the 17th century. Is that not amazing? Yeah, that, I would say that's fruitful. I'd like to have that kind of life, you know? Now, the average grapevine can live from 50 to 100 years. But, but you want to talk about productivity. You want to talk about fruitfulness. And Jesus is using the grapevine as a metaphor for a reason. He's saying, if you will abide in me, you will have that kind of fruit. You will bear not just a little bit of fruit, but much, much fruit. You'll bear much fruit. And they say that when you, when you plant a grapevine, a lot of times it does take four years, four years to get a full harvest. The first two years, no grapes. The third year, half of a harvest. The fourth year, the fourth year is when you finally see some, some productivity. That's when the full harvest comes, four years. Sometimes in the Christian life, it may take a little while to see that fruit come. You know, if you've been walking with, if you've been living for yourself for 20, 30, 40 years, and all of a sudden you come to Ed's church and commit your life to Christ, and, 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 and you look at your life in a few months, and you're like, man, I don't have a lot of fruit in my life. I wish that I had fruit like him or like her. And you look at other people that have been walking with Jesus for a long, 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 long time, you know, you're probably not going to have the fruit that they have. Because you've got to undo 20, 30 years of, 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 of wrong thinking and living. And you've been living for yourself, man. Now you're trying to live for Jesus. It just may take a while. Somebody that's been walking with Jesus for a long time, they get the, the compounding effect of, of, of maximum fruit, man. Because, because they've been doing great things for God. They've been serving the Lord. And the fruit is just growing and growing and growing and maturing. But here's the great news. If you will abide in Jesus, you can have that kind of fruit in your life too. But it's not just automatic. Jesus says, abide in me. you got to keep abiding in Jesus. you got to keep doing it. Here's the third thing that the Bible tells us. Number three, you will have an effective prayer life. You'll have an effective prayer life. If you abide in Jesus, you will have an effective prayer life. Who would like to say, I pray about things and things really happen? That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like, look at this, what it says right here. If you remain in me, this is verse 7, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Now, we love the last part of that verse, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. But God is a gardener, not a genie. Look at this in the first part. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. What is the Bible saying? When the word of God is in your life, then the word of God will come out of your life. And when the word of God is in you, you will know how to pray. See, not everything that we pray is according to the word of God. You can pray about whatever you could dream up. We can pray about all kinds of crazy things. But when the word of God is in you, it guides your prayers in order that you would know how to pray and what to pray. And, and, and it helps us to understand how to abide in Jesus. So the Bible says, when the Word of God is in you, and, and you're in the Word, and the Word is in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. That's why we need to commit ourselves to learning the Word of God. You know, that's why we need to read the Scripture. I hope you read a little bit of the Bible every day, because you need the Word of God. If you want to abide in Jesus, you got to have the Word in you you got to study the Word. you got to learn the Word. You know, you, some of us, you know, you may be going through a time in your life where 
you need God's word so bad in your life, maybe you need to come to all three services here at Heads Church for the whole weekend. You know, so you can get the word of God in you. There's times in our lives where we just need God's word even more than, than other times. But reading the word of God, you know, listening to the word of God, studying the word of God, reading the life of Jesus, reading the Old and New Testament, the word of God gets in you. And when the word of God is in you, it starts to come out of you. So we got to abide in the word of God. And, and, and one of the, 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 the end results of that is that you'll have an effective prayer life. I love what Pastor Mark Batterson, what he said about prayer. He said this, who you become is determined by how you pray. Who you become is determined by how you pray. And ultimately, the transcript of our prayers becomes the script of our lives. How about that? He also goes on to say this, the greatest tragedy in our life is that prayers go unanswered because they go unasked. I wonder what in your life is going unanswered because you've, You've not asked, or you've not continued to ask. We ought to be praying big, bold, audacious prayers. It brings honor to God. Don't just pray about all the little safe stuff that you know is going to happen anyway. Pray big, audacious prayers. I, I hope everybody here has at least one big prayer that you're praying. You know, at least that one big thing. At least one, and if you don't have a big prayer, I'll tell you, pray that Edge Church can buy this building soon. Amen? We pray that. I'll give you a big prayer. Just pray that. If you don't have one to pray about. We ought to pray some big prayers. When the Word of God is in us, and we are in the Word, then Jesus says, then ask whatever you wish. You know? So if you pray about something and it doesn't happen, ask yourself, was the Word of God in me, was that praying according to the word of God was God's word in me and, and and maybe it wasn't so let the word of God dwell in your heart and then what comes out of your life will be successful prayer look at this in number four in verse eight God will be glorified if you abide in Jesus God will be glorified you know the greatest honor the greatest compliment to a Christian is that people would say I see Christ in her life I see Christ in in their family. I see Christ in the, the way that you conduct yourself at the office. <laughs> God is glorified. People see us, but they see the God that we serve. And if you're a Christian, you can see Christ in people's lives even before you know whether they love the Lord or not, or you've talked to them about what church they go to or whatever. You can discern that. When you're not a Christian, a lot of times what people do is they look at the life of a Christian and they say, I don't know what it is about them, but there's something different about them, and that's attractive. What is that? <laughs> what is that? God is glorified. God is glorified. And when we abide in Jesus, God is glorified. Here's the fifth thing. You will love others. Love is the crowning virtue of the Christian life. In the verses 9 through 10 and in verse 17, Jesus teaches us about love. Love. The gospel is about love. Jesus is about love. If you hate people, love cannot be in your heart. You cannot hate others and abide in Jesus. The, the, the things just don't go together. So when we abide in Jesus, we will love others. We'll love others. We'll love people that are different from us. We can even love the people that make us crazy. You know, We can, we can love people that we're different from. But love will be in our lives. It's part of abiding in Jesus. And then finally, we will have great joy. We will have great joy. Joy, joy. Look at this in verse 11. I, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus says, man, you abide in me, you'll have joy in your life. The Bible doesn't say you won't go through some hard times. You won't go through some adversity, but you know what? You can have joy even when the world around you is falling apart. Do you know that? That's why the, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, when you're abiding in the vine, you will have joy in your life that will give you vitality and strength to fight and to overcome the adversities that you're facing. We need God's joy. Joy is the thing that helps us get up in the morning 
when we don't feel like we got the strength to do it. The joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord comes by abiding in Jesus. By abiding in Jesus. I was at the store the other day and I bought some, some fruit snacks for my kids and I looked at the box at the store and I was like, what do they put in fruit snacks? Do you may love fruit snacks here? Some fruit snack people? I was like, fruit snacks are awesome. Yeah, look at this. Strawberry sensation and cherry orange wildfire. Oh my goodness, does that sound great? I know I'm about to let you guys go and you can eat lunch, but I looked at the ingredients. Let me read to you the ingredients of a strawberry and cherry orange wildfire fruit snack. Here we go. Pears, corn syrup, dried corn syrup, sugar, partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil, citric acid, sodium citrate, something I cannot pronounce, fruit pectin, dectose, malic acid, and natural flavor color. Right below that it says it's gluten free. Now it's gluten free but it may kill you, right? That sounds awful. Isn't it interesting that there's no fruit in the fruit snacks? It kind of looks like fruit, but it isn't fruit. And here's the question for our life this morning. Is the product of our life a fruit snack or is it real fruit? Is it the real deal? And listen, when we abide in Jesus... The product of our life will be real fruit.